Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. One of the best actresses working today gets what feels like a long overdue chance to be the center of the story with Mark Turtletaub's sensitive new film, Puzzle. The great Kelly MacDonald plays a sheltered housewife who finds a new sense of self and independence when she stumbles upon her talent for solving puzzles. Let's take a look. How are you, Agnes? The same. Not good. That happens sometimes. Every day. Same thing. The same thing. Every day. So the root of all suffering is our desire not to suffer. No one asked you. Louie. What's going on? Mom just did a puzzle. Only children play with puzzles, Agnes. Remember thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Puzzle partner. I'm here about the puzzles. You seem to have some mark on your forehead. It's Ash Wednesday. Is that a problem? No, not at all. As long as we don't have to share the prize with the Pope. <laughs> a competition? I'm doing it. Honey. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. You're so much more comfortable when you're focusing on the puzzles. Turns you on. He's using you. Everybody always uses you, and you let them. I don't know why someone like you would find me interesting. You are modest and strange and beautiful and funny. <laughs> Does that make me weird? No, just different. Life is messy. There's nothing we can do to control anything. Where's dinner? I slave all day for this family. What's wrong with you? When you complete a puzzle, you know that you have made all the right choices. All right, puzzlers, on my count. Three, two, one. You gotta tell me everything. I don't have to tell you anything. It's the best thing I've ever done. Faith, ambition, love. What other pursuits can give you that kind of perfection? To getting all the wrong pieces right. Everybody from the wonderful puzzle, director Mark Tuttletub and Kelly McDonald. Hey there. Hi. Hi. Hello. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Congratulations on this film. I've, I've gushed about it backstage. I will gush about it here. It is a very sweet, very subtle, beautiful film, and it feels like we don't get enough of these movies anymore. Movies about adults that are, you know, this is for the whole family, but I think it's also for adults. It's for people who want to watch a deep story about a singular person. And we just don't get enough of those anymore. We mostly just get comic book movies now and John Wick movies, which I like. Yeah, there's a place for those as well. But yeah, a few more of these would be good. And now uh, I have to say, I've been a fan of yours forever, you know, since Train Spotting. You, you've just been so wonderful on screen for so long and in Boardwalk. And this feels like I can't think of another time where you had a leading role like this, where every scene you were the center of attention. Is there another one that I missed? There missing? is another one. Shit. It was a while ago as well, though. Um, I played Stella in a movie called Stella Does Tricks, and I think it was similar. Like, I was in most frames <laughs> in that one, but yeah. And so what is it like sort of jumping back into, in, in, into that? Like, when Mark brought this to you, when someone was like, I've, I've, I'm thinking of you for this role, I want you to do this. I, I didn't think about it, to be honest, about the lead role aspect of it until I started doing press for the film, and that's what well, everyone... Us assholes were like, you're a lead now. Yeah, I was like, oh! Um, I just sort of... I saw it as being an ensemble piece, and I was part of um, a really amazing ensemble, and um, so I felt quite comfortable, and I'm glad I didn't think about that too much because I would have been, like, acting really hard or something. <laughs> <laughs> what does acting really hard entail? Uh, you know, I don't know what I would have done different is what I mean, you I know. the best leads probably also think of their job as a part of an ensemble, whether it's with the crew or with the other members of the cast uh, in the film. Now, Mark, this is um, inspired by or based off of an Argentinian film from uh, 2009. Argentinian, excuse me, right? Yep, yeah, right. From 2009. Same name. What made you want to take on that story to, to sort of remake it and situate it in a in the US, Northeast yeah. particular? Well, it starts with the writing. I got, I, I received, I didn't develop, we have a production company, usually we develop our own. In this case, we didn't develop the story. 
and I didn't see the original film, so it just crossed my desk. I got the screenplay. Two friends who are producers sent it to me, thinking I might want to direct it. It was like an original work for you, essentially, when, exactly. you, when you got your hands exactly. on it. Exactly, and I don't get screenplays very often that are that well written, that are about a female character uh, at the center over the age of 40, finding her voice. It's such a rare moment. Uh, to find, and so, you know, such a beautiful story. Uh, and uh, it was personally compelling to me. I kind of recognized the central character. I said, that's my mother. I know that woman. And so all those sort of lined up for me, and I, I said, absolutely, I'd love to do this. Someone said that, that when I was watching the movie with them last night. They said, this is your mom. And I said, no, it's not. It's don't, let me watch the movie. <laughs> um, but uh, was this Oren Moverman's script that came across your desk? Had he yeah. Been, right? He would, yeah. His, yeah. Oren, uh, Oren did the, uh, the, the lion's share of the work on it. And it's, uh, I think it's, you know, it's really special. Most of what you see on the screen I received on the page. Wow. Um, Kelly, what attracted you to this role? I, I mean, it always um, starts with the writing. Um, when I respond positively to a script, it's just really easy after I've, I've got quite a lot of experience now and it's quite easy to spot the good ones in just a few pages. And um, and the fact that Agnes was just so interesting and without without being it being a showy story or she doesn't she doesn't behave appallingly. She doesn't kill anyone, but she makes a few mistakes. And and um, and I just I think it's just a really tenderly told piece. It's the kind of story that finds moments that you haven't seen before to maybe tell things that have been told before, mm -hmm. which is sort of what a classic story, a good movie is. You know, I think about the, the college letter that's brought up at, at one moment in the film, and that was never a thing that I saw coming or the moment that I saw that would be the change you know, in, in this character. I thought that was developed so sweetly and subtly behind well, the scenes. Well, I think that's the thing. It sort of never becomes the movie you might think. It, there's so many points in the movie you're like, ah, and then they're going to win the puzzle competition. It's not about the puzzle competition. It's like, ah, she, you know, she has an affair and she falls in love with this guy. Not that. And it's not that either. It's about her um, coming to terms with... Um, the realization that there's a person inside that she's never given a voice to and nobody's ever seen. And her sort of being like, I have a voice, I want to explore this personal and individual as an individual. You know, you said that uh, after doing this for so long, you can look at a script and sort of see good writing fairly quickly. What does that usually entail? I mean, it just broadly, what is that something that you're like, okay, I'll keep reading this? It's pretty much that simple. Um, something that I, I kind of, I instinctively feel I, I, I'm, I can bring something to as well. I mean, I read, I read a lot of scripts, and um, and I, you know, it, I there's so much that I read that I know is clever, and I know is like great writing, but not. It, it needs to be something, something else, something that speaks. Um, to me without sounding pretentious, which I just did. No, that's okay. We allow pretension on this stage. I, I can tell you the moment in the movie that I was really pulled in that I recognized the writing and the directing as well was the punchline of the cake and finding out whose party it was mm. and the fact that she brought the cake in and just being like, just gut punched by how sad that idea is that even though these people care about her and love her, they don't know to just be like, hey mom, let me get this for you because it's your birthday, you know? Right, yeah. That's what's beautiful about the writing, not to, not to go on and on about it. But, yeah, in five minutes, it's in the first five minutes of the movie, you get, uh, you get to know who this character is in that scene. Uh, and, uh, and then from there, she begins to change. She's, just, she's sort of invisible in her life, I think, you, is the thing that you come away from it with. Invisible to herself, it, to herself, but definitely, you know, she's walking around this party. She's been preparing for the party. Um, she's walking ar around giving people hors d'oeuvres, and nobody looks at her. It's like she could have been hired, and then you realize her party. Her birthday. Right. Party. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we do is we obsess upon little things when you're making a film, and, and it's ridiculous how much time you'll spend thinking about one thing. But I wanted early on uh, to have Agnes sort of meld into the background and, and, and melt into the background. And, and so uh, 
one of the ways we wanted to do that visually was we have a dress on her. We, we, we picked the perfect dress and wallpaper that needed to sort of match, not in a garden state kind of literal way, but close enough that she literally, you, you, you like, where is she? Where's the background? You know, now that you say that, I vaguely remember yeah. like the colors in that opening and kind of a wash of her right. in there. And also, it just, it's like my superhero power. I can fade into the background <laughs> uh, with sheer will. Yeah. Can we put that in a movie? Like, what's your power? Yeah, this is <laughs> just kind I of fade. dissolving in the background. No. <laughs> you know, you said that you didn't really think about uh, being the lead for the first time in some time, but this character is about a woman sort of becoming the lead in her own life as well. And as you've gone on press tours and started to think about that, have you found or thought about any of the sort of meta levels that are coming along with this character being the one that has brought you into the a focus as well? Well, I suppose it is sort of... It, the character of Agnes is a, a, a character I'd sort of... I felt familiar with from prior work, but I knew there was something different about her, and I, it was only in the doing of it. And now that I watch it, I can see, I can see what I was doing. It was sort of instinctive day-to-day um, -day stuff, but um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. What do you mean, stuff that you were doing instinctively? Well, I, I don't sort of... Um, I don't go in having done a huge amount of preparation. I mean, I had... Um, I, obviously, I'm American in it. I hope that was coming across from the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, uh, uh, very specific accent, Bridgeport, Connecticut. So I was kind of all about that, for mostly before I started. And then um, I was just, I just knew Agnes was someone that I, she was, it was familiar territory, but there was something, something extra. And I'm glad that everything came together in the, you know, the writing, the directing, the, um, the casting. I don't know, it just made it into... Where did the idea for Irfan Khan come from? Because I hope I'm saying his name right, Irfan Khan. You are. You yeah. are saying it right. Uh, because as soon as the two of you get on screen together, there's this moment where uh, uh, you just kind of go, oh, these are two really charming actors that I'm happy to see on screen, oh. like performing together. No matter what they're going to do, I'm just happy to watch them play in this sandbox for a little bit. Yeah, I felt the same way. You know, it's kind of interesting. It's like, you know, you don't really know what's going to happen until you see it happen. Uh, I don't rehearse, so we didn't rehearse. As, uh, as a team, we talked about key scenes. So what you're getting is much more alive. It's more like theater, and I love that. I love that quality. And Irfan plays such a uh, such a unique character that you don't really know what you're going to get in the next moment, which is perfect for the story, because Agnes is coming from a world which is pretty small and pretty predictable, and then she comes to New York. She bangs on the door of a strange man. And it's Irfan Khan, and and he's he is Irfan, and he's very physical, and he makes all these gesticulations, and you just even more so than what's in the movie. He's walking around in circles, and I'm watching, thinking, how am I going to cut this? Yeah, and uh, I'm you know, feel and of course it cut that. beautifully, but it's he's you know he played this character really in a in a way I've seen no one else like. Like I, that's that's got to be a performance and an actor that when you're watching as a director, where you go, well, this I didn't have this in mind, but okay, let's see how this is going to happen because so many of the things that he's doing are are downright weird. Uh, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I, I, you know, some of my favorite actors like Nicolas Cage back in the day, and you'd be like, that's a really weird thing to do, but I can't stop watching it. Yeah, that's what makes really extraordinary performances, I think. Uh, I was reading not too long ago about a, a, a well-known uh, older director saying, uh, every time I cast an actor, it's like a little death. And what he was trying to say was, I know, because I wrote these words, or I envisioned these, this, this scene, how it should be said and played. And I look at it just the opposite. Every time I'm fortunate enough to have to work with Kelly McDonald, Irfan Khan, David Denman, they're going to bring something that I didn't anticipate. And that's, I think, what we're talking about. Do you go into scenes thinking about how you can bring something to the table that will not be anticipated by the director or, or like big choices or? I no, not that, but I do. There are think two very different acting styles. Such, I think going on with you and I've worked with, with people that sort of do both. I definitely prefer what I feel um, I do, which is like I I I go into a scene and I listen. <laughs> 
And some people have already worked out entirely what they're going to do. And you kind of, you get a gist of something, you know, from rehearsing it on your own in a hotel room or wherever. But um, but I think 90% of it is is sort of listening and reacting. Well, what was it like when, since you didn't do any rehearsals, so you go into those first takes with Irfan and he's kind of <laughs> moving around and big and you, you're you're doing your thing. What What was that like? I was just, I was, he's just so compelling, you know. I, I could just watch him forever. Um, uh, and so it was just great. And also the time that your fan, sort of, when he began the film was just as all the, my sort of cast family had wrapped. So we, we shot all the family stuff first. Oh, wow. They all said goodbye and I was really devastated because they were my guys. And then, and then your fan arrived with this, crazy energy and enthusiasm and this like you were saying the physicality and he just sort of breathed new life into sort of what had you know everybody was getting a bit tired and you know we were a bit into the shoot so um he yeah. does this uh wonderful thing as an actor uh, where scenes that are mundane or you know are like hello or people getting to know each other he plays very big and moves around and stretches out. And then the scenes that are actually like heavy emotional scenes where I think most actors would, yeah, would try to jump around and be sort of emotional about it. He kind of just slumps over and <laughs> says the lines. Yeah. And it's this direct opposite approach. He's so annoying, actors. isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that hard? Was it annoying for you? No, <laughs> annoying. Just annoyingly yeah. talented. Oh, we're going to play it this but way. You can, do, can do those things. It's pretty incredible. I've got one good story about that. So, uh, so I making a story with uh, with a woman at the center, and it's about her transformation. So, and uh, and I'm a guy, right? So, how do I tell that story authentically? Even though I'm inspired by it, I felt like I needed to have a woman in the editing room, and so I interviewed different editors, and I had worked with some, but I didn't choose them. I, I wanted a, a female editor that, and I met Kate Haight. And liked her very much, and we got done as we're two thirds of the way through. I said, "So, Kate, why should I work with you?" And she said, "Because I'm a female, and you need, besides being talented, I'm a female, and you need a woman's voice in the editing room." And I went, "Yes, okay." So then we shoot the film. We spend 30 days shooting it. She's cutting simultaneously, and I'm not seeing what she's cutting. And I get into the editing room, and it's all earphone. Every, you know, she's got earphone all over the place. I said, "What happened?" She said, I fell in love with him. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Was it like that? On I don't speak to Kate anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we ended up recutting some of that stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining you would, yeah. He's just so charismatic. But you know, Kelly, Kelly is in every scene, and she's very, uh, she has a, just talk, give, give her red ears for a second, but she, she has a quality. In Scotland, they say, don't get above yourself which means don't, you know, don't get all full of yourself. And it's, I think it's, it's not only a Scottish thing, but I think it's also Kelly, and that she's truly uh, a generous actor, and as opposed to an actor that's pointing to themselves all the time, saying, look at me, look at me. And, uh, as a, but yet it's, the performance is so compelling that you're drawn and you're, it's a magnetic performance. And so it's a really interesting thing. She's not drawing attention to herself, but you can't stop looking at her. Now, I feel like I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How often do you get scripts where uh, the story is one woman's transformation? Oh, <laughs> I mean, once a decade? <laughs> uh, not often, not often. Now, um, if that script hadn't have been as sort of great as it was just on the page in terms of the writer, would you, because you don't get scripts offered like that enough, have like been interested in trying to develop it or work on it? Or would you have, because you're, there's such a dearth of, of scripts like that being proposed to you? I think um, I have noticed a big difference just in the past couple of years. And, um, you know, I feel like, I, I don't know, there's, 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 there seems to be more interesting parts that I'm being offered the past couple of years, and I don't know if it's if it's because I've reached an age that it, life gets a bit more interesting, you know. And um, I, I I don't know why it is, but um, I'm, it's, it seems to be pretty consistently good at the minute. Oh, that's 
that's good. Yeah. That's great. I know. Look at me all positive and Scottish. Um, I will I will say, as much as we were sort of talking about Irfan Khan's uh, performance, you know, he does get to sort of pop in and out of the film and show off a little bit, and he does a wonderful job, but you are the center of the movie, and it is a very difficult performance because she is, for the most part, quite passive throughout the movie, and at the same time, you still have to present an active character that an audience can be involved with. Yeah, well, what I hadn't realized as well from reading the script was how many... Um, scenes I'm on my own <laughs> with no dialogue and um, I've always sort of wondered what it would be like to be in a silent movie I think because I moved my face I've been told by friends far too much <laughs> and um, and but your friends yeah like as an actress or just like over drinks like stop moving your face I literally in New York <laughs> a few years ago I was meeting my friend in a bar and she saw me I was waiting to cross the road and she ran out from the bar at a certain point um and grabbed me, and she was like, why do you keep making faces? You know, like, I was clearly thinking about something and um, was off in my own little world. But, yeah, it's a malleable face. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Mark, we probably should have started with this question, but what, you said you, had to, you hired a female editor because, you know, you knew that you were a man telling the story of a woman's transformation, but once you decided that this inspired you and that you wanted to make it, how many kind of, like, intellectual and emotional hurdles did you have to go over, jump over before you said yes, just because there is that fear of being a man trying to tell a woman's story? None. I actually had no, no reservation. No, I had no reservation. <clears throat> when you get a great screenplay and you, and you resonate with it, you just know intuitively, and I think it was the same thing with Kelly and, and David and, and Irfan. You read it and you go, I, I love that story, I can tell that story. So That's I, also because you're a man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. So uh, there'll, there'll be times that I'll like, say yes intuitively and then intellectually you go back and forth. I didn't do that with this. I read it and I knew I needed to do it. Good, good one. That was well, good. a woman would be doubtful if she could, she could. If she could pull it off. Yeah. Like 50 people who tell oh me God. I can't do this. Yeah. I don't know if I want to deal with that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who's a question? Hey, guys. Thanks for being here today. Really looking forward to seeing this flick. Uh, Kelly, I actually had a question from my mom who's watching online right now. Oh. Uh, hi, Nancy. Uh, hey, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> hi. Hello, Nancy. Mom. Hey there. Hey. Hey, girl. She lives in Scotland about half the year. Ah. And she wanted to know what kind of process do you go through day to day? You touched on this a little, but what kind of process do you go through when you're developing an American accent, like for this movie, or like an Irish accent on Boardwalk? Yeah. And what's that experience like? Um, I start the preparation as soon as I can, really. I mean, quite often I'll, 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 I'll get on board a project and then there'll be hardly any time in the run-up to it. But if I'm lucky, I get a bit, a bit extra time. But I really am a lastminute.com kind of... I mean, it's all... I do most of the hours in about a week and a half. The week and a half before I start shooting wow. is when I really... And I just listen and listen and... And I uh, annoy my children and um, like talking the accent as much as I can. Cool, thanks. <laughs> uh, next question. I think this is the last question that we have. Hi, um, Kelly. I know everyone knows you from uh, Brave as Marita. I was wondering what was it like getting to come back to that role for uh, Wreck It Ralph 2? Wreck It Ralph 2. It was really, really fun. I'm lucky enough to be in two films um, with John C. Riley this year. Um, That's right, Holmes and Watson, Holmes and right? Holmes and Watson as well, which will be out. The return Christmas. of Beryl and Riley, oh, I'm very excited. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, but I um, I just loved, I didn't think, you know, Brave would have, I don't think there's going to be a sequel or anything for Brave. So when I was, I got a phone call and asked to just come in and um, mess around and come up with some Scottish things for her to say, it was just really fun. And also I've seen, I've seen the scene, I don't know if you know, it's like, it's basically, there's a scene where Vanellope happens upon a room in the internet and it's all the Disney princesses, which I still can't get my head around that I am a Disney princess, but, um, <laughs> so it's all of us and they're all crazy. <laughs> Like really super duper weird, and you know all their stories. The stories are so famous, but then when you hear them saying, "Well, this happened to me," um, it's it's really hilarious. So, uh, you know, I have to ask: Holmes and Watson is the return of John C. Riley and Will Ferrell together. I think since Step Brothers, which um, uh, I am a Step 
Brothers fanatic, fanboy. It's hilarious. Yeah. It's the best, maybe, maybe the greatest comedy in like the last 20 or 30 years, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it like being on that set? Were you forced to improvise with them? And how, how does that go? Almost immediately. And that's not a world that I come from, comedy and improvising. Um, and I didn't quite, I was in the room suddenly on the first day and I didn't, I thought, how in the heck has this happened and why have they cast me? And, and um, we basically would do scripted scenes and then you can just throw things in there and mess about. And they do that so incredibly well together. But I remember the first the first thing that I did, because I'd worked with John, I had done a few scenes with John first, and then I, it was my first big scene with Will, and I was kind of, I suddenly got all nervous all over again, and then I had this scene where I had to sort of, at the end of the scene, I leave the room and shut the door behind me into the corridor, and then it's like, and cut, and and then the door opened after I'm cut, and Will Ferrell was standing there looking at me with these weird dead eyes, and he was going, funny, <laughs> like he pointed at it said funny and I was like okay and it just made me it, 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 you know he's a very he's, he's a very funny man and a very good man and I think he he sort of he was very kind to do that yeah. um Mark how did you what what made you cast David Denman you know I haven't seen him in in something since uh since the office yep. uh and he's really great in this I think so too. So uh, the father figure it would be really easy to make him a stereotypical character, you know, sort of the the heavy with his wife, the uh, you know insensitive guy. And I wanted this character to not be a stereotype, not to be a stick figure, as I put it. I wanted somebody that loved his wife, loved his kids, but was a product of how he was raised. And so I needed someone with a lot of heart. And I knew David could do that. When we sat, I said, that's my picture of this character. And he felt exactly the same way. And I think he does it beautifully. There's a moment in there where, without doing a spoiler alert, where he takes a piece of, uh, of glass out of uh, Kelly's foot. And it just, every time I watch it, I'm quite touched by it. Uh, and I think that's been the, uh, we've done screenings around the country. And everyone talks about how much they like his performance for that reason. He, he c- truly cares about his wife and his kids. And he's just, he just is unaware. My favorite moment with him was uh, just a quick moment where he turned around and said, do you want me to sign up with you? Yeah. And I thought, oh, he cares. He loves he's, her. He's he loves decent. Her. Like, he loves her. He just takes a little extra time. Oh, and to there's times you out. cringe. I mean, he does stuff with you cringe, right? There's a scene where he grabs uh, Agnes, and he's a big guy. He's like 6'4 and, and, and big and, and broad. And Kelly is a small woman, and he grabs her. And as we were rehearsing, he, you know, as we were blocking the scene, he said, I, the way it was written, he pushes her up against the wall. And he said, if I do that, you'll never care about me again in the movie. And he was absolutely I think right. I'm huge. Yeah, I'm Not only that, but we'd lose our, you know, we'd lose Kelly. So uh, we. I think David should get a lot of the credit as well because he was like every scene he was, um, you know, he's such a nice man himself, and he really struggled anyway to play this. <laughs> he's not even a villain in the film, but he felt like he was this villainous character, and he really had a hard time with it. And and so he was like consistent in in just just sort of stepping it back that bit more from and the humanity yeah. yeah 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 which is so necessary when you come to the last act of the of the film without giving anything away spoiler alert you know? huh that's where i'm stopping that okay. that what i'm saying right there i'm not spoiling anything i don't think so no. uh puzzle how can people see puzzle it's a wonderful film opens this friday july 27th uh in new york and la and then it will go wider so come everybody please give a big round of applause for mark and Kelly. let's hear it <laughs> 